Welcome to the Tactical Brief, dear investors, speculators and traders. Today I want to talk about one of the quintessential questions in investing. Can financial markets be predicted? It's a question everybody gets excited about, obviously, because if you know the future, you know how to make money. Uh, so this little lecture uh, I gave last year on several occasions in front of trade organizations, fund managers and at universities. And it used to buy me good lunches and good dinners. So for your benefit, I've cut it down into four parts to not uh, use your patience up too long. I hope you will enjoy it and you see me in a second on the smaller screen. So let's get right into it. This was the last lecture I held on this topic in Arnhem at Nimwegen at the university there at the Arnhem Business School and that was on the 5th of December 2019. Can financial markets be predicted for my series Volatility, Probability and Beyond? Quick introduction, you can pause the picture and see what I've done. I'm a retired derivatives trader with 30 years of experience and pause the video and have a look at the stations I went through. The risk disclaimers in English and in German. Um, please always notice that uh, by investing you can lose more money than you originally invested. Uh, even more so when you trade in derivatives, which is obviously my background. So, can financial markets be predicted? How do we approach this topic? We start with predicting the markets by using the standard model. It's not like in physics where we have a standard model uh, uh, for particle physics, but it is uh, a set of terms we've all agreed on and which can be observed in the past and are therefore not disputed. So how do we answer this question? And I love to answer it with a normally yes. What you can see building up on your screen right now are the returns of an asset, of any asset. In this case, all the green cubes falling down represent one day of returns. For example, uh, the cube coming down at minus 2% uh, represents one day where the market showed, the, this particular market showed a return of minus 2%. If it comes down at plus 6%, it uh, shows that the market, this specific, uh, specific market, displayed a return of plus 6% on this day. And on and on and on. What is already obvious, you can see the small returns uh, deviating around the zero marker are far more often uh, than the outliers, either to the upside or to the downside. And this you can observe on any financial asset in the long term, how returns are distributed. One thing to notice is price is not the same as returns. In green, you can see the price distribution. The price distribution is skewed to the right. What does that mean? The red is the return distribution. I just showed you with the little cubes coming down and they built this almost perfect shape of what later on will be shown to be the bell curve, the representation of it. Uh, however, prices, at least before oil went negative, can't go negative. So therefore, you have the price distribution skewed to the right. Yeah? It can either go zero or it uh, can go uh, uh, to infinity if possible. Well, we've seen Tesla at the moment. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. Uh, while I'm shooting this video, I'm recording the market and now everybody's gone full retard. Anyway, that's a different topic for a different day. So let's have a closer look at this again. On the left side, you see the distribution of the returns, the plus minus 2%, 5%, 6%, 10%. And on the right in green, you see the price distribution of an asset. What does that mean? Well, this bell curve here behind the beautiful charts in yellow simply depicts something that happens to returns of financial assets. And what you can see here, a couple of assumptions we always have to plug in. Returns are random. That means whatever's happening in the market is purely random if we want to employ this model. And on the long term, it seems as if it is, but I will get into this point a little bit later extensively. Then returns are independent of each other. This is also questionable, but it simply states that what happens today has no influence on tomorrow and what happened yesterday had no influence on the returns of today. How true that is, you might want to judge for yourself. However, long term, this is a distribution we see. And returns fluctuate around 
a median, an average, and this is the gray bar here right in the middle. So what does this graph tell us? The statistics simply say that 68% of all returns we observe will fall within one standard deviation. That's the term for the gray part of this bell curve, where we, dis where we expect distributions not to go too far out to the left or to the right. And then with two standard deviations or probability of 95%, they will fall into this whole zone comprising the gray and the green parts. And with three standard deviations, obviously we accept, expect 99% of all uh, uh, returns to fall within this bracket, uh, which is all nice and good, but obviously what we're also interested in, what we've seen quite recently happening a lot is this, the radioactive part of the distribution. Uh, the parts when we are beyond three, four, five standard deviations and markets misbehave in a way which is uh, well not very facilitating to an investor who is long and very uh, complementary for the investor who is short or well hatched in these markets. So how can we crack this? There's a practical approach and I love to quote Mike Tyson um, as a tale of caution. Of course we're developing a plan here and I'm trying to show you what holds true for the market. However, there are surprises. You remember the little radioactive sign I showed you? So everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And uh, he is a philosopher. Um, this will be true for everybody who is engaging in financial markets. You might have had that experience yourself once in a while. How do we approach that? The standard model, as I call it, I will explain to you an example, including the VIX which is the volatility index quoted and the best known index in the world to measure this volatility of the S&P 500. It's, you've heard the, word, the phrase is the fear gauge or, or, or the fever curve of the market, which is represented by the VIX and I'll explain to you in a second what that actually means. So what is the VIX index? VIX index expresses the expected trading range of the S&P as seen by market participants who trade in options. The VIX index is calculated by using implied volatility of at the money options with a maturity of one month. The prices of served of these at the money options, these are options, if the index said 2,800 or 3,000, then there would be at the money options calls and puts at 2,800 or at 3,000. Yeah? They enter into a pricing model, the famous Black Skulls model, and when you have all the ingredients you can extract out of this formula, the implied volatility, which shows you the expectation of market participants, how far the market is going to wiggle in each direction, to the upside, to the downside, the magnitude of it all. You've already seen it, the higher the VIX, the higher the magnitude, the smaller the VIX, the smaller the expected magnitude. And what is not on these slides, actually, there's a very, very good correlation of almost 77% uh, of the VIX level of today and what will happen in realized volatility in a month time. And I've used this term volatility now. There are actually three, and I'm going to explain to you what we mean with volatility when we talk about those. Here you can see the historic realized an implied volatility. What have I done? I showed you what happened already in the S&P from 2017 to mid-2018. So if we can observe this, yeah, we look into the past, then we can simply calculate with a normal formula the volatility these returns experienced around their mean, around their average return. Let's assume on average they were plus minus zero and the volatility then expresses us what, how far we on average deviated from this return. Okay, we've seen the past and the past is easy to predict. What are we interested in? We could make a killing in the markets if we would know the future realized volatility, the stuff that will have happened in the future. So you start here, we look into the past, that has happened then we want to have a look into the future, then we could use the same formula again to calculate, oh, that will have happened. Unfortunately, we don't know what will happen or what will have happened. It's lovely, the English language. 
So we are interested in pointers, which could point us possibly in the right direction. And this is the so-called implied volatility, which is represented in the VIX index. This is today. We just looked a year back and calculated what was the volatility of the index over the last year. And then we want to have an estimate or an educated guess how will the wiggling, the volatility in the future possibly be. And the VIX index gives us exactly this indication what might happen in the future. How's it going to happen? I've already said to you the implied volatility needs to be calculated and that becomes part of the index. So we have everything in the market we can observe. We know its maturity of 30 days in these options. We know the price of the S&P. We know the strike price of the options. We know the interest rates and we know the price of the calls and puts market participants are willing to buy and sell for. All this gets plugged into the Black Scholes formula and returns the VIX index. Everything is possible from A to 120. Yep, 8 is obviously very low, hardly ever happens. 120 is very, very high, hardly ever happens at all. As you can see, this is the VIX index and I've retired this uh, presentation in December. So this is only data up to September 2019. If you would run it forward, there would be huge spikes, obviously, uh, facilitating for March. So what does that mean now? We have an implied volatility level, which has been given to us by the VIX index. What does that tell me? And that is the beauty of this so-called standard model. It gives me a curve, a curve where market participants expect the market to be in the future. The future realized volatility is the quest we have and implied volatility gives me a rough and ready forecast. In this rough and ready forecast, you could see what happened at this point in time. Volatility was roughly at 13, 14%. And the yellow uh, line represented the one standard deviation. The level of whom we expect the index to trade with 68% probability to not exceed these yellow lines or to stay within them. That is a statistical probability of 68% and that is well proven in the past. And now you remember when I said the correlation between the VIX index today and what will have happened 30 days into the future or 21 trading days into the future is a correlation of almost 77%, which is very high. So we have here a good statistical indicator which might tell us what is going to happen in the future and that the market participants on average, get it right, what they see. And they will obviously adjust their uh, bidding and selling attitude. So there will be a new implied volatility calculated, which you can keep track of as well. So what are you going to do out of that? The VIX index, in this example, you can see is at 12%. So the VIX ex uh, index gives the expected range for 252 days, one trading year by convention. So there are a lot of people making mistakes. They think the VIX index gives the, uh, the trading range over the next 30 days. Yes, implicitly, yes. But the quote is always for an annual expected range. So a VIX index of 12% means simply that the market, let's assume it's trading at 2,800, will in one year's time with 68% probability not trade above 3,136 and not trade below 2,464, which is 336 points to the upside or 336 points to the downside. Once we've established that, we can do all sorts of things with the VIX index. For example, now we want to see what's the trading range for one day. So we take the VIX index and divide it by the square root of 252 trading days. That's a bit of uh, options math. That's the convention. Um, that you have to, if you want to approach the volatility, which is nothing, nothing but the square root of the variance, if you want to calculate that, go into the mathematical con concepts uh, if you're interested, but that's a simple rule to follow. You always divide it by the square root of the trading days you want to observe. So we come out at 0.76% expected trading range for the next day. If volatility here is at 12 in this example would mean Upside, downside, 21 points over one day could be expected in the S&P if 
the volatility, the future realized volatility will resemble something like the guess that is given to you by the VIX. Obviously, another example, now I'm interested in a month period. And that is simply, again, a month has 21 trading days by convention. That means 3.46% to the upside or to the downside. So we expect the market to not exceed 97 points to the upside or fall below 97 points to the downside after one month within the 68% probability bracket. Don't forget, there's a second, third and fifth and infinite standard deviation. It could go higher, but the odds here are at 68%. So the last example is for three months. We have here 6%, arrive at 6%, which means over three months, we simply take the daily expected return, 0 0.76, multiplied by the square root of 63. These are our trading days. And we end up plus minus 168 points to the upside or to the downside. And if you want to look it up, uh, what I mentioned just, it's called the square root of time rule. So what have we done here? If you remember the slide I showed you a little bit earlier, we've simply wrapped the statistical probabilities which have been observed over markets in time, all time, always come in true. There are variations to it, but that doesn't question the whole model that is behind it. So we've taken this, what we've seen at the bell curve, the returns coming in, wrapped this up and constructed this volatility cone out of the implied volatility which the market showed us, uh, market participants expect future volatility to be. And from that, what I've just done in these few examples, you can construct a so-called volatility cone, which will give you a very good idea where the market is most likely not going to trade. This is very, very interesting for option traders, because what you want to do, if you sell options, where would you like to sell them? You want to have them expire worthless, so you sell them with a probability of above 50% that they will expire worthless. If you buy a far out of the money call, yeah, because you, you expect a 10 bagger, you have to be realistic about the probabilities that this is going to happen. And you already see they have this huge payout, if you're right, because the probability is very, very small that it's going to happen. So this volatility cone constructed, uh, with a volatility that was in the market, I think it was here 12%. In this example, I said earlier 13 or 14. It could be anything, but uh, my Excel sheet did it automatically for me. And interestingly enough, you see that when we run towards the volatility cone, we tend to stop there for a while, take a breather, look around, and then maybe we go through, which we've seen here on the downside in December 2018, where we had this little massacre happening in the market. However, at the beginning, you see we are sliding along the yellow line on the upside. And in fact, for almost all these uh, uh, distributions, we ended up within the volatility cone. So easy predicting markets, isn't it? Uh, we have a formula. It's not too complicated. We have indications in the market with very high correlations and probabilities. And we will close part one with this. And in part two, everything I've just, I just showed you, I just demonstrated to you, we will be busy in dismantling the standard model why everything I just told you might in fact not be true. Pure statistics might not work. So is everything beta, the market randomly fluctuating, or is there alpha in there? Skills. I see you in a second in part two.